All right, we're in the book of Proverbs. Guard your mouth review. Remember, Proverbs is wisdom literature. Purpose of the book is to make one wise. Wisdom is the ability to handle life with skill. Remember, Proverbs is a very practical book. And to be very practical, it also has to be very deeply theological. So it's, you don't sacrifice one for the other. Proverbs addresses all the areas of life in a practical manner. And this morning, we're going to examine the topic of guarding your mouth. And I'll put that into some context. Beginning text, Proverbs 4.24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious lips far from you. The Bible has a lot to say about the tongue, the use of the tongue. I mean, it's throughout all of Scripture. We see it in James 3. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts or birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Uh, that's our introduction. <laughs> we're not going to do an exposition of these verses, all right? But we're going to look at the context. If James, remember now, James, the, the epistle to James, is considered by most theologians to be New Testament wisdom literature. It's kind of like a New Testament book of Proverbs. So it's not unusual that we would find this type of teaching in the book of James. So I only started with this to show the importance, the urgency uh, that the scripture places on controlling the tongue. Small but deadly. The introduction to these verses that we just read says this. This is verses 3 and 4. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Notice, bit, very small piece of metal in the horse's mouth. And with that, you can direct the entire body of the horse. It's amazing if you ever watch any equestrian activities. That little bit, little tug this way, little tug that way. And it depends, too, on whether you're riding western or eastern, which way you tug. So you don't want to mess it up. I only know that because my daughter took it. Behold, the ships also, though they are so great, are driven by strong winds, are directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So there's the principle. You know, it's these, these small things can set the whole course of, of, of something that's large. So large horses are controlled by a small bit. Large ships are controlled by a small rudder. The tongue is small and yet can do great damage if uncontrolled. There's the urgency that the scripture places on it. So reviewing the context, the major themes that we've looked so far in our studies in Proverbs are the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, which is probably the underlying theme for the whole entire book of Proverbs. Uh, we also saw how listening to parental instruction specifically given to young people, is one of the major characteristics of Proverbs. We're told in no uncertain terms to avoid evil companions. We're told that we, when the Lord disciplines, we should accept it. And we went through a whole series on, you know, how do we accept the discipline of God as opposed to resisting the discipline of God. The importance of proper role models. And in chapter 4, which is what we're in now, the main theme is keeping on the straight and narrow, okay? And yes, I know I use the old spelling for straight. That's not a mistake. So the whole theme of chapter 4 is keeping on the straight and narrow, and that's summed up in the last three verses. Let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. That's, those three verses are a summary of all the teaching from chapter 4. <clears throat> now, last month, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Last month we examined the concept of guarding your heart, for those of you who are here. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And today we're going to examine the mouth, and there's a very big reason why, uh, other than just that it's the next verse, but put away from your deceitful mouth, put, evil, put de devious lips far from you. And one of the reasons why we see this in verses 23 and 24, guard your heart, guard your mouth, is explained to us by Jesus talking to the Pharisees, is you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Notice I title this the heart-mouth connection. There's definitely a connection between what's in here and what comes out of here. All right. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. The evil man out of his evil treasure uh, brings forth what is evil. In fact, at our mentoring group uh, on Thursday night, I don't know if you, if you remember, I was clipping the cigar and with John's clippers and I caught my finger in it and it hurt. I mean, it really hurt. And um, after, after I put it down and finally did everything I was gonna do, I turned around and I says, well, did I pass the test? I didn't curse. <laughs> I don't remember what you said. I said, did you do so in your heart? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know that. Part. No, you don't. And you're not going to know either. <laughs> All right. See, the, the Pharisees were called hypocrites by Christ because their speech uh, didn't match their hearts. All right. But there's more than one way to be a hypocrite. All right. It's, it's usually involving the tongue. All right. But in fact, there are two misconceptions and I couldn't help but but pausing here in, our, in the study just to talk about this. Some people say that if I do something that I don't want to do, then I'm being a hypocrite. And now this is usually uttered by somebody who is in the church. And they don't want to do something, you know. Like for, you know, like, for example, come to a Bible study or something, and they're only, you know, Sunday morning Christians. That's all they do, all right? And you confront them, and you say, you know, you really need to come out. You need to study the Word. You need to be in fellowship. And, and that. They say, well, you know, I don't feel like it. And if I came out, then I'd be a hypocrite. <laughs> That's not being a hypocrite. It's absolutely false. God commands you to love even if you don't feel like it. All right? God commands you to forgive even if you don't feel like it. You can't say, well, I'm not going to forgive the person because if I do, I'm, I'm going to be a hypocrite because I don't feel like forgiving. No, that just makes you disobedient. Acting against your feelings in those cases is not hypocrisy. It is obedience. All right? Second misconception about hypocrisy is that a hypocrite is only someone who pretends to be religious and is not. All right. Now, that is hypocrisy, but it goes deeper than that. That's another false statement. If you are a Christian and you act contrary to your faith to be accepted by your peers, you are a hypocrite. In other words... If you keep your mouth closed in the work environment and whatnot, when you should be opening your mouth and, you know, explaining your Christian faith or, or at least being salt and light, and you're not, that's hypocrisy, all right? And comes under the same condemnation as the other type of, uh, of, of hypocrisy. And this actually may be one of the worst types of hypocrisy since your heart has true, if you're truly a Christian, your heart has been changed and you're not reflecting it in your mouth. That's a dangerous position to be in. Remember what, what James says, for the person who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, it is sin. So the Christian is called to have a godly mouth. There's our text again. What then is a godly mouth? First, and this is coming from 
all scripture, as you'll see. First, a godly mouth is a mouth that praises God. Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, there are numerous psalms. You can't read the book of Psalms uh, and without turning a page and seeing that concept that, of blessing the Lord uh, with all my heart and with my mouth. All right, so first, it's a mouth that glorifies and praises God. Second, it's a mouth that speaks wisdom. All right? My mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. This is what we are called to do. Third, it's a witnessing mouth. If, you are, if you've been born again, how can you not tell others, especially those that you love, those that you respect, how can you not tell them about the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus? So, so a godly mouth is a witnessing mouth. Psalm 71, 15, my mouth shall tell of thy righteousness and of thy salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. Fourth, it's a thankful mouth. It's amazing how many Christians are just so ungracious and, and unthankful. Psalm 89.1, I will sing the loving kindness of the Lord forever to all generations. I will make known thy faithfulness with my mouth. Fifth, it's a lawful mouth. One, Psalm 119, with my lips I have told of all the ordinances of thy mouth. And again, Psalm 119, 176 verses expounding on the importance of the law of God. I know it's become fashionable in, the, in our society today to say that the law is relegated to the old covenant. Jesus disagrees with that, as we've seen very clearly, that not one jot or tittle shall pass away. Six, it's a pure mouth. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Uh, something I just want to remind you of and show you, point out, notice how each of these verses ties in with some of the others. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but also such word is good for edification. That's talking about wisdom. Remember, wisdom is knowing how to apply the knowledge that God gives you. All right? And that's why wisdom is not just uh, something that's granted to you. It's something that you have to work out. Work out your sanctification with fear and trembling. Seventh, it's a truthful mouth. Colossians 3, verses 8 and 9. But, no, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, uh, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And eighth, it's a mouth that glorifies Christ in everything. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or deed, notice, word or deed. It's not just what you do, it's what you say. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. All right, so those are just some of the character, eight characteristics of what a godly mouth looks like. What about the ungodly mouth? Greg Bonson once said, an ungodly mouth is the greatest expression of a man's autonomy. You know what autonomy is. Autonomy means man's law, as opposed to theonomy, God's law. All right? And so he says, an ungodly mouth is the greatest expression of man's autonomy. Why do the nations rage? Why do they say, release us from these feathers, fetters, kick them off, you know, Psalm 2. Uh, we see that. So what does the Bible say then about the ungodly mouth? First, it's evil, deceitful, and foolish. Well, there's a mouthful. <laughs> Psalm 36, 3, the words of his mouth are wickedness, deceit, and ceases, cease to be wise and to do good. What's the opposite of wisdom? It's foolishness. And remember, that's a moral... Uh, determination in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom is, uh, foolishness and wisdom are not uh, intellectual 
properties, according to the book of Proverbs. They're moral properties. The wicked is foolish. All right. The Christian is wise. Okay. Second, it's a hypocritical mouth. Psalm 50, 16. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? That's kind of strong, isn't it? In fact, that's a little sarcastic, isn't it? Think about it. God speaking to the wicked, specifically to someone who is espousing the things of God. And God looks at him and says, you have no right to say what you're saying. Think of how many people this, think of how many false prophets, prophets are in pulpits today. Right? And this is, this is a direct, a direct, directly aimed at them by God. What right have you to tell? Is this the basis of your gift of sarcasm? <laughs> yeah, well, this is one of them. It's one of them, yes. And I've had to work out my sarcasm with fear and trembling. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I heard it. He's just working his way into it in my, one of my next sermons. I'm, I'm trying to get When you least expect it. <laughs> Third, it is arrogant. Psalm 59, behold, they belch forth with their mouth. I love the analogy of scripture. You know, the arrogant person, they belch forth with their mouth. It just flows out, you know. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? There's an arrogance. You ever see somebody just railing against God as though, as though God wasn't there, you know? And what does the scripture say when somebody is railing against him? He sits in the heavens and laughs. God is not, God is not provoked. Fourth, it is prideful. Psalm 59, verse 12. On account of the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be caught in their pride. And on account of curses, the lies which they utter. Oops, that was too quick. Prideful. Let them be even be caught in their pride. That's the ungodly mouth. Fifth, it's an untruthful mouth. Proverbs six twelve. A worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a false mouth. Sixth, it causes trouble. Proverbs eighteen six. A fool's lips bring strife and his mouth calls for blows. Seventh, it brings destruction. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. That's the description of the ungodly mouth. Now notice, 180 degrees apart from each, each one of them. So, based on the scripture, it's important to guard our mouths. That's absolutely clear. Doctors look into our mouths to see if there's any indication of disease. Remember, when you ever go to have a checkup, what's the one of the things? I hate that. Open your mouth, stick out your tongue. You're, ah, I hate that. You know, I have a tremendous gag reflex. All right, but why do they do that? Because the inside of the mouth, specifically the tongue, is an indicator of disease. It's one of the first indicators that something is wrong. The tongue changes. They call what is an oral checkup. We're going to do a moral checkup. Little play on words. And also looking at the use of the tongue. Now it's interesting. The tongue is an indicator of physical disease. The use of the tongue is an indicator of sin. And I think God designs things that way. All right. So we're going to bring, begin a moral checkup. By the way, all the questions that I'm going to be asking are rhetorical questions. They do not, I'm not looking for a, an answer. And uh, I, rem I, I remember a Smothers Brothers uh, comedy routine that they were doing. And 
Tommy was, Dickie had just explained to, to Tommy what a rhetorical question was. He didn't have to answer it. It didn't require an answer. So Tommy just looks at him and says, piano. He says, what's that? He says, that's a rhetorical answer. It doesn't need a question. <laughs> past the terrible jokes. <laughs> You're right. You're getting into the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> the moral checkup. First, this is how to determine do you have a godly mouth or an ungodly mouth. First, do you gossip or discredit people? Psalm 15. This, by the way, this is one of my favorite psalms. O Lord, who may abide in thy tent? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? The psalmist is asking the question, who's going to get to heaven? And the answer, he who walks with integrity, works righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. And then notice, he does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his, na- to his neighbor. He does not slander with his tongue. So the first question is, do you gossip or discredit people? Second, do you speak maliciously? James 4.11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and the judges and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. So do you spe- is your speech malicious to somebody? Third, do you stir up trouble with your mouth? You ever notice that there are some people who are always taking somebody aside and telling them, you know, did you know this happened? Yeah, I, that happens to me, used to happen to me a lot as the pastor. Somebody would say, Pastor, I think you should know. Soon as I heard somebody say those words, I go, time out. Why do I need to know what you're telling me? Are you going to tell me that somebody's in sin? Well, I said, well, if that's the case, you know, the Bible says you are to go to that person. If you know that somebody's a brother is in sin, you need to go to that person. The Bible doesn't say if you know your brother is in sin or have an offense against him, run to your pastor. It doesn't say that. It says you go to him, try to resolve it, and if you can't resolve it, then bring one or two witnesses. I should be, and and this is funny because everybody says, Pastor, you should be the first to know. According to the scripture, I should be the last one to know. (laughs) So do you stir up trouble? He who speaks truth, what is right, but a false witness, deceit. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. Isn't it? Amazing, the graphic language that the scripture uses for the poor use of the tongue. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is for a moment. People think that they can lie and get away from, get away with it. It's just not the case. Fourth, do you publicly criticize people? Proverbs 25 Starting verse 8. Do not go out hastily to argue your case. Otherwise, what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor and do not reveal the secret of another. Lest he who hears it reproach you and the evil report about you not pass away. Notice. There is a way to handle issues within the church specifically. And it's done privately. Private sin needs to remain private. One of the, you, you see this as a rule of law with the, throughout the, all of Scripture, and that is that things should be dealt with in the sphere of influence that it, that, that it has over it. So if you have a private sin, that should be dealt with privately. Public sin has to be dealt with publicly. Okay. And notice what it says, the evil report about you so it won't pass away. The other person will be vindicated. Fifth, do your words amount to humiliation or mockery? Galatians 5, 
But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Notice the same, the consistency again of Old and New Testaments. There's no, no inconsistency ever. Sixth, is your speech coarse? Ephesians 5, but do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not, whoops, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And you know what I mean. There's all the, the dirty jokes, bathroom humor, bedroom humor that has no place in, in, a, in a public setting. Seventh, do you say things jokingly and then pull them back? How many times have you heard somebody come out with a comment and they realize that it's hurt somebody? And they say, oh, you, you know, I was, I was just kidding. I didn't really mean that. You know what Proverbs says about that person? They're a madman. You're crazy. If you think you can throw a firebrand, an arrow, and death, and it's not going to hurt somebody, you're not in your right mind. So, the, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, was I not joking? There's an old expression, uh, an American proverb, many a truth is said in jest. And that's right from this proverb here. Eighth, do you exemplify the points you criticize in others? This is one of my favorite pieces of sarcasm in scripture. And why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Just pause on that for a minute and think, think of what Jesus is saying. And get the picture. You're there examining your brother's eye, and you got this big log sticking out of yours. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold the log is in your own? Hypocrite. First, oh, I, sorry about that. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So do you exemplify the points that you criticize in others? Ninth, do you receive people in the best possible light or do you always question motives and reason? Acts 2, this is, this is 20, I'm sorry, Acts 28. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened to his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. We do things like this all the time. You know, we pass judgment over someone, all right, or question their motives. And we were guilty of the same thing to these. Oh, obviously, if this was what happened to Paul, then he must be a murderer. Okay. First um, Corinthians 13. And sometimes we don't go all the way down, but love bears all things, believes all things. When we do, when I do premarital counseling, I, I emphasize this point you have to take your spouse, but any Christian, when they tell you something, in the best possible light, and unless there is some a compelling reason not to believe them, you to believe them at face value. That's exercising biblical love. All right? Now again, unless there's a compelling reason, I'm not saying, because we are told to be wise, innocent as serpents, wise as, I mean, wrong way, innocent as doves, wise as serpents. Tenth, do you speak with love from your heart? First Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it's not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, 
and here we have bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's a biggie. You, you could, in fact, if, if you take nothing away from this morning except re-examining 1 Corinthians 13, we would all do well. Eleventh, is your speech kind? Ephesians 4, 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. That's the negative, the positive. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God in Christ has forgiven you. Twelfth, do you speak with sensitivity? The golden rule. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Amen. Proverbs 25, 11, Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. One of the things that we see in Scripture and um, is the combination and, and the, the hanging together of truth and love. We are those who are supposed to bring the, the truth uh, to, to a world that's full of lies. But the message of scripture is while you're bringing truth, it should be in a covering of love, a covering of kindness. Proverbs 3, let not truth or kindness depart from your lips. The apostle Paul talking to the Romans, and he says, he says, and I know you were able also to confront one another, confront one another in love. So bring the truth, but bring it in love. And that's something that we have to always keep in mind. As those who are reformed in our persuasion, we have a big emphasis on truth. And sometimes we negate that truth by bringing it in an unloving manner. And that's something that we must not do. Thirteenth, are you careful to tell the truth? Are you accurate? Exodus 23, you shall not bear a false report. Do not join with your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Okay. Ephesians 4.25, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then, of course, our text, the one we started with, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Fourteenth, do you keep your word? This is a pet peeve of mine. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond these is of evil. Christians have a habit Listen, we need a group of men, we need a group of ladies to come out and to do X, Y, and Z on Saturday. Who can be there? All the hands go up. Saturday comes and what happens? You have only half the number of people. If you're not going to be there, don't say you will. If you say you're going to be there, be there. You're, this is exactly what Jesus is, is. He's correcting the error of the Pharisees, the hypocrites, who would swear, but they would swear in such a way that they could weasel out of it. As John was saying earlier, you know, they don't swear by the altar, they swear by the gold, and the gold does mean I, I can get out of it, you know. No. If you say, yes, I'm going to do something, I've, I've made this a practice because this really affects me. I've made it a practice that if I have an appointment with you, if something comes up that I can't make that appointment, I will call you and ask your permission to reschedule. I don't just call up and say, by the way, I can't make it, can we reschedule? I call up and say, if something has come up, and would it be all right with you if we reschedule the appointment? That would help me out. If the person says, no, that's the only time I can make it, then I'm going to have to make arrangements and I'll be there. Because I gave my word. As soon as I said yes and put it in my calendar, I gave my word. And I can't go back on that without 
getting permission from the person I gave my word to. Right, so just, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Fifteenth, do you flatter yourself? Proverbs 27.2, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Okay. Um, now I'm not going to go there. <laughs> no, maybe I will. I'm not that smart. I'm not that wise. I've heard people actually in their prayers flatter themselves. And we, meet, we, we need to be careful, you know. It's so easy to want to make ourselves look good. And, you know, we're told just the opposite, you know. First will be last, the last will be first. <coughs> Sixteenth, do you take the Lord's name in vain? Obviously, in the Ten Commandments, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Okay. There's many different ways to take the, name, the Lord's name in vain. Everybody, as soon as you say this, they, they're thinking of, of cursing with the Lord's name. And that is an element of it. But you have to stop and think, what's the definition of vanity? Vanity is an emptiness or, or mis moving off the mark. Using the Lord's name in when you should not be invoking the Lord's name is also taking the Lord's name in vain. You know? Yes. And anything of that nature where we just take the Lord's name in vain, you know, without really meaning to, to, to call upon him. That's also taking the Lord's name in vain. So that's our moral checkup. I'm not going to ask you how you did. Uh, but are there any questions? Okay. New feature. Terrible jokes that make you laugh anyway. Maybe. What do you call a fake noodle? An imposter. What do you call a fly with no wings? Yes. A walk. <laughs> What did the Buddha say to the hot dog vendor? Oh, wait. Make me one with everything. <laughs> <laughs> what did the janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? Hmm? Supplies. Supplies. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're terrible, but they still make you laugh. <laughs> what did the buffalo say when his son left? I found Yeah. I found <laughs> They call a psychic little person who has escaped from prison. No, oh, no. The small, medium, at large. <laughs> What's the most terrifying word in nuclear physics? Oops. Yes. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> what did Blackbeard say when he turned 80? I am 80. Did, did, did I just hear Jerry groan at yeah. that? <laughs> if there's anybody who has no right to groan at these, Jerry and Shoot. 
What's the what's the dumbest animal in the jungle? Polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a man who can't stand? Yeah. Yes. 